Hi, Misha here, and welcome to the re-recording of the video on the Key 27, the Type 97 Army Fighter, originally kind of informally known as Abdul, later Nate. And this was the Japanese Army's premier frontline fighter, really right before World War II. So it saw a lot of use in the, in the China, Burma, India theater area into the 1940s. And over here we have the Navy's Mitsubishi A5M, the Claude, which I've already done a video on. But now it's time to look at Nakajima's Key 27. Now, what happened? Yeah, I recorded this already. I could blame technology, but it's really me. I record videos for this channel, but of course I record for the Mishiko channel. And uh, in, in memory cards, I probably have half a terabyte, probably 428 sticks. Even then, you'd be amazed how quickly they fill up. And I thought I had already edited and at least uploaded, if not published, the Key 27 video, so I deleted the files off the memory card. We're also going through new cameras here and changing things up. Anywho, my mistake. I will own it, so here I am redoing it before Jay gets here and we do a main video. But I, some people had asked about this, and this is a really cool plane. And uh, this is a model from D, D, or D Augustini. 172 scale diecast. Really, it's based on the old IXO tooling. And uh, these aren't in America. In fact, this one I got out of Romania. I found a neat seller on uh, eBay. And he had several I was interested in. Some you've already seen, some you will see. And I said, Hey, I'm interested in these four. What can you do on shipping? Because individually, shipping was as much as the models from Romania to here. He said, well, if I took five, he'd knock shipping way down. Way, way down. And there had been one, the A7M, the Mitsubishi, the Repu, that I was kind of toying with. And that was enough to push me over the edge because the savings in shipping more than covered it. But one of the first aircraft he had that really grabbed my attention was this Key 27 Nate. This is an interesting plane, like I said. And there's a lot of history behind it. This was the Army's first low-wing metal monoplane. Now, originally, the Army really had just adopted a new fighter. It was the Kawasaki Type 95, the Ki-10. This was a biplane, but it was adopted only in 1935, with testing going back a couple years before that. This was that time of rapid technological improvement. Now, uh, Nakajima had submitted the Key 11, also a biplane, but lost out. Well, going to the A5M here, the Navy was needing its first monoplane, metal plane. Notice it's an open cockpit. Originally it would have had a two-bladed propeller, later it went to three. And this was adopted as the Naval Type 96 fighter. And they did do a land version in Nakajima. Excuse me, a Mitsubishi of this, known as the Ki-18. And the Army did look at it. But... The Key 18, the land version of the A5M here, just didn't have the, the turning, the maneuverability that the Army was becoming obsessed with in the mid-1930s. So they uh, passed it up, announcing a new series of trials in very late 1935, early 1936. And the three principal companies that were involved in making prototypes 
were of course Nakajima here, Kawasaki, and Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi would make a further refinement to their design known as the Key 33, and Kawasaki would make a mono wing version of the Key 10 known as the Key 28, and Nagasaki would make a mono wing version of the Key 11 known as the Key 12. Yes, yeah, not, not this yet. The Key 12 was a very advanced design for its day and time. It had retractable landing gear, and it had an inline liquid cooled engine. But kind of much what happened with the A5M when Mitsubishi tried to introduce these changes in the mid 30s to the Navy, the Army looked at it, said, good plane, but too, too advanced, more than we need. So, Nakajima went back to the drawing board, kind of devolved the design a bit, and that's when we get the Key 27. So, this aircraft, the prototype, would first fly in October of 1936, and very quickly go into trials into that year against its other uh, competition. And in 1937, it would be selected, not for reasons you might initially think. It wasn't the fastest. It did not have the best climb. It wasn't the cheapest. It wasn't the best built or the best armed. What it was, it had a low wing loading. And so it had very good maneuverability, very tight turning. And this is really what the army was becoming obsessed with. You can really see it with the Key 43 Oscar. And they really don't break out of it until you get to the Key 84, at least in some aspects. So, the Nakajima they selected, they would order 10 pre-production models for further testing, including in the field, because the Second Sino-Japanese War would kick off that summer. And from there, it would go into full production. But they would make some changes. So this was the Army's first kind of modern aircraft. And this was the Navy's. The Navy was very much focused on speed and range because it's the Navy. And the Army was focused on dogfighting, turning, and what have you. So these were pretty much concurrently in production. This model here, before I continue on, is, is pretty well done considering the relative low cost of these. The body is metal, very solid. The propeller does spin. It has, of course, fixed landing gear. One neat feature, you notice those blisters under the wings, tanks, you can display it with or without them on there. It comes with two panels, one flush and one that bulges out. And when you get these Diagostinis, just like the IXOs, there's a little bit of assembly required because they put them in pretty thin packaging. So you plug in things like the landing gear, which if this had retracting gear, you could either do them up or down. But on fixed gear planes like these, they're just, you know, down. <laughs> they don't rotate, but they're, you know. And you have to install various antenna. Now that's the vertical, the on the the, the PyTot tube on the wing, those come pre-installed most of the time. Because again, it's it's the vertical measurement, because these were usually packed with magazines and sold at news agents. Also has a very tiny little skid on the tail, which is kind of neat. And it has a very basic canopy with a very basic interior. Little seat, little stick. It doesn't open, no pilot figure. You can put 
a 172 scale pilot in there if you want. They're they're not meant to open, but you can very gently pry them open, put them in, and put them closed again without doing damage because I've done that on some planes. But yeah, they come with a decent little stand that has the make and model. And again, they usually come with a neat little magazine. Oh, this one is in Romanian for obvious reasons. <laughs> so, what about the key? 27's service and some of its production changes. So after the small pre-production batch which had limited field testing in 1937, these were ordered into full production. The key 27A would go to an enlarged wing. They would also go to an enclosed cockpit canopy. And the updated key 27B would further improve the canopy, its functions, and it would give the plane the ability to carry either four 55-pound bombs under the wings or two 130-liter tanks for range. The uh, aircraft is not the smallest. It's a little under 25 feet long with a wingspan of just shy, or just over, I should say. 37 feet. Production models had a top speed of around 290 miles per hour, with the cruise speed around 225 miles per hour, and a maximum altitude of around 33,000 feet, although rarely did they operate high because their performance was better low down. Like I said, she didn't have the best climb in the world, but she was maneuverable, hence the giant wing. Armament was originally two 7.7mm .7 machine guns. Later, on some planes, one of these would be swapped out for a 12.7mm machine gun, which is essentially a Japanese 50 caliber Browning. It's not the same as some people have pointed out, but it's it's basically their equivalent. The Navy would use a 13 millimeter. The Army used their 12.7, and it has a two-bladed propeller. There would be other versions, including a two-seater for training, and these would be produced not only at Nakajima but a couple of other factories as well. And they would build quite a large number. Well over 3,300, approaching 3,400. Production was started in 1937, and these were first sent to China in mass in early 1938, and saw combat in the very late winter, early spring. And early on, they did exceptionally well, because they were going up against older Russian biplanes and other kind of cast-offs. However, later on that year, the Key 27's adversary would appear. This guy over here, the Polykopov I-16. The initial number sent to China seems to have been around 250 in 1938. I'm not going to go too much into this aircraft because I've done a full video, but this was really the first of its type in the world. It was the lightest mono-wing fighter for a long time, also the fastest at various times, and it had retractable landing gear, although it still had an open canopy. Even the versions they tried to do a closed canopy, the pilots weren't happy. This model is uh, from Oxford. It's also 172 scale diecast. Probably doesn't have as much feature as the uh, D'Agostini. The propeller doesn't spin, the gears don't retract. I did put a little pilot in, he didn't come with it, but I just put him in. Why not? But these are also cheaper, and they're very durable. They're good little display models, or gift models, they really are. I like the Oxfords. They have very bold panel lines, though, which might annoy some. Initially, when these two met, they were pretty well balanced. Earlier versions of the 
I-16 had a top speed of around 280 miles per hour and originally they were fitted with two 7.62 by 54R machine guns quickly a third was added but then versions came out with four 7.62 machine guns and they added more armor and they added a more powerful engine and the top speed would creep up to 300 miles per hour and then eventually over 320 miles per hour and some late versions would even be fitted with 20 millimeter cannon but this was always a limited thing because the cannon were in limited supply because Russia so early on these two were pretty well matched the Russian plane was a little bit faster the Japanese was a little bit more maneuverable Early on they had basically the same armament, but quickly the Russian would gain quite a bit more. Heck, they even put unguided rockets on these. And it was a small, light little plane. Although it had its detractions too, including high landing speeds and so on and so forth. And it didn't really like the heat. The Japanese plane was definitely designed for the Chinese type theater, the Asian theater, better. So early on, they were machines were pretty well matched, which gave the edge to the Japanese pilots, which had more experience and were better trained and more dedicated, and they were fighting an offensive war. But in 1939, the tide began to turn. There was a famous battle in Mongolia where Japanese pilots would go up against Russians in the I-16 and not fare as well as they would have hoped. So... As new versions of the I-16 came online, and the older I-15s, the biplanes started to kind of be taken out of theater, the Key 27, the Type 97, did not have the clear edge. But it still had well-trained and dedicated pilots, and it was still a very maneuverable machine. So they would try to maneuver the Russian planes in the situations that favored the Nakajima, and in the beginning they were pretty successful at this, but the, ja the Chinese and the Russians weren't stupid. They themselves eventually adapted new tactics too. And so it was a bit of a back and forth between 1938 and 1940 to see who had kind of the upper leg. They were, they were pretty well balanced, but in the end, the I-16, the Polykopov, was a superior plane. One of the few times you'll hear someone say that. Nevertheless, against older planes, including some Western planes, the I, excuse me, the, the Key 27 was still doing quite well. But it was a first generation mono plane, and so its days were, of course, numbered. And even plans like this were very quickly considered obsolete by early World War II, by early 1941-42. So the uh, Key 27 was already kind of being sought after a replacement for, which would lead to the Key 43 Oscar, which I've done two videos on now. But the Oscar would be problematic in the beginning, meaning that they had to lean heavily on this aircraft early in the 1940s. But finally when the Oscar was in full production, they would terminate production here around 1942, maybe still assembling some planes with leftover air frames for a while. But of course these would stay in service through 1945 and the end of the war because, well, they made over 3,300. Of course they did. So we know how it did against the Russian plane. How about Western planes? So against the Allies, as I said in the beginning, this was originally known as the Abdul, at least in the China Burma theater by the American Volunteer Group, the Flying Tigers and others. 
but this name did not stick. Instead, it was assigned the reporting name Nate. The story is kind of interesting why. Abdul was actually assigned to another aircraft. The Type 97 Naval Fighter. Never heard of it? Well, it didn't exist. And there's a... If I can find it, I'll link it in the description. There's a very interesting period video, American military training video, that's supposedly helping new recruits ID Japanese planes. Um, it is incredibly racist, even by my standards. Uh, I'll let you watch it if you want. Just, just know that it's quite of its time. But anyway, my point is, they essentially got all of these mixed up. The Key 27, the A5M, and the later A6M. They basically thought, when they first encountered the A6M, the Zero, that it was a Key 27 or an A5M with an enclosed canopy, which the A5, the A5M didn't have, and retracting landing gear. They didn't realize that it was an all-day airframe. So there was a lot of confusion as to what was what, and they really didn't know what the Japanese had before Pearl Harbor. Once war was declared between the Japanese Empire and the Allies, namely the USA and Britain, of course, Australia is too, in the Pacific. The Key 27 was still being used by the Army because, like I said, they had trouble with the Key 43, the Oscar, getting it going. These were primarily used as escorts for bombers, like the Key 21, the Sally. When they were doing raids in late 41 and early 42 on the Philippines, Singapore, the East Indies, Malaya, and so on. Of course, these continue to see some use in China as well. But they were going up against second-generation Allied mono-wing fighters, be it British Spitfires, the U.S. Navy's F-2A Buffalo, which, yes, there were planes that the Buffalo could uh, best, and this was one of them. The... Uh, Army's P-40, a plane I've done a video on. Very underrated, but a very good ship for when it was there. Because by this time, first-gen mono-wings like the P-26 P-Shooter were mostly out of service. I think the Philippines still had a few P-26s, but that was about it. And yeah, so what it was starting to go up against in 1942 was just better. And they couldn't do much with the design. Like I said, they did try fitting it with the 50 caliber gun, but that was about all they could do. The problem there, when you have one 30 caliber gun and one 50, they're going to have different points of impact, different bullet trajectories. So aiming became more difficult. And while it was still maneuverable, its uh, lack of climb and speed left it with some very big shortcomings so once the allies much like the russians chinese had done before learned of its shortcomings they could easily eat it up therefore production was halted in 1942 and by 43 these were pulled out of frontline service and basically sent to the home islands and some occupied areas to be used as third line defense and training aircraft again there was a two-seat version and there they would stay through 1944. But in 1945, you know what happened. Kamikaze. Now, that's not what the Japanese army called it. They had all kinds of fun names that I mentioned in other videos, but same, same difference. Suicide planes. They would pack these with over a thousand pounds of high explosive and try flying them into things. Be it B-29s, ships, or formations of troops, what have you. That was primarily what the Key 27 was used for in 1945. But, kind of 
horrifically, they did try using these as last-ditch defense planes, interceptors, fighters, in 1945. Key-27s went up against F-6F Hellcats, P-47s, even some P-51s, and F-4Us. And to be honest, yeah, they were they were decimated. I was actually impressed with the minor successes they had. They still managed to shoot down a few Allied planes, and they managed to not all be wiped out in the first three seconds. So while it was horrific, as you would definitely imagine, they had more success than I thought was possible. <laughs> and of course, the planes flying in 1945 were kind of patch jobs because production had ended earlier. They were putting, you know, cannibalizing some planes to keep others running, so on and so forth. But they did fly through the war. And this plane is singularly important because this is when the Japanese Army Air Force decided to really emphasize turning maneuverability especially at low altitude, and kind of become very myopic, leading to the shortcomings in the Key 43 and some later planes. And like I said, they wouldn't shake out of it really until the Key 84. I mean, there's an argument for the Key 61, but it was kind of its own thing. For frontline, just general dogfighter planes, you go from this to the 43 to the 84. But the 44 and the 61 in the middle is more specialized interceptor types. It's also interesting, you know, this is when they, this was the 97. After that, they would roll over to the type 1, 2, 3. This isn't because they changed their naming system. This has to do with the Japanese calendar when they transitioned from 1937, 38, 39 to 1940, 41, 42. That's also why the 0 is a type zero fighter because of the year 1940 which was the year 2600 in their calendar meaning this was adopted in the year 2597 and the Oscar was adopted in the year 2601 and uh, yeah I don't know if any Nates survive today intact. I'm sure p bits and pieces do, and I'm sure there are plenty at the bottom of the ocean and in bogs, but I don't know. I don't think any flying examples exist, that's for sure. If anyone knows, let me know. I didn't really look before doing this. It's amazing how few Japanese planes really survived the war. It seems like we have quite a few German, because that technology was lifted and studied in the U.S., Britain, France, Russia. But Japanese technology was consistently underestimated. Now that's not to say it was always the best or cutting edge, but it was often better than what the Allies, especially America, gave them credit for, at least before and early in World War II. By the end of the war, I think respect had been earned. Because they did have some good aircraft, like the Ki-84 and the ready to go but never put into full production A7M well guys that's my redoing of the Nate video and since I had to redo it I thought I would try to expand upon it more and hope it was worth it I uh, think it's an interesting plane it really kind of completes the Japanese fighter lineup that's for sure and I really like these uh, De Agostini models they do a great job Especially with their, uh, and they're mostly art, the Japanese. But they do a lot of planes like this that uh, other companies just don't. This one sits on its stand pretty securely, too. But yeah, it's, it's pretty heavy. This is the wings all metal. Part of the tail's metal up here. It's plastic here. But this is all metal. The body's metal. Obviously, the canopy isn't. And the wheels aren't, but uh, I hope they're starting to import these into the U.S. Flying Mule and uh, Aikens have had the Key 43, the Key 44, the 61, and the 84. But I haven't seen the, this plane or the 
A7M. They are starting to bring in some of the navies too, like the D4Y and the B6 and B7. And they've had the VAL and stuff, the D3 for a while. I don't know, I like them. And it, these are priced at a point where you can actually afford to have 10 or 20 and not break the bank. So yeah, I am grateful to the seller in Romania. I mean, to be fair, for five aircraft, he charged me $10 shipping. Not per plane, total. And they all came in great. One or two boxes, a little crumpled, not his fault. But the planes inside, because these are very well packed, they're, they're boxed within boxes within boxes. And again, things that might snap off in transit, like the gear or the propellers, you install yourself and they plug in, actually pretty darn securely. But a dot of glue will always keep them very secure. With that, guys, I'll let you go. Um, I would say let me know what other planes you'd like to see, but honestly, with Japanese... You get what you get, but I do have more planned, so uh, check those out. I'll probably cross back over into the Navy, and I have some uh, more Eagle Moss Navy ships to show you, too. Hope you enjoyed these. I definitely enjoy making them. With that, I wish you a very good holiday weekend. This is Misha. Catch you next time.